So I'm going to talk about um, navigation. Um, and the title is The GPS in the Brain, um, which, so I did inherit this uh, title as well, uh, but I think it's a very good title. Um, it, and it's going to help me organize how I'm going to explain the function of this, uh, this area. Um, I hope you'll agree that it's not too fanciful. So I'm going to talk about an area you've heard about already, the hippocampus. Here's the hippocampus uh, in the human uh, brain and the hippocampus in a rat brain. Um, the hippocampus is very well conserved um, across mammals, meaning that it has a very similar structure, similar uh, uh, connectivity. Uh, there are, uh, it's a little bigger in the, in the human, but it, it, it potentially does very similar things. And what we know about the hippocampus, the, 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 the cardinal uh, thing we know about it is that it, it's important for memory. So if you uh, lose your hippocampus, um, it's a little bit like the fellow in the movie Memento, if, you, if anybody can remember that movie from uh, 15 years ago. No. <laughs> um, it causes a very severe anterior grade amnesia. So you can't form uh, new memories, and not just any kinds of memories, but uh, personal um, memories of your experience. So if, if, uh, if I ask you to think back, what did you uh, have for dinner yesterday? You, you have to go back in your mind uh, and place yourself in that situation again and relive that experience. And that whole um, experience is supposed to depend on the hippocampus. Now I'm going to discuss a, a, a different view of the hippocampus with this GPS analogy, but I hope you'll see that there's a way to come back to memory uh, and memory function. So how do we find out about the hippocampus? Um, we try and record the activity of hippocampal neurons in animals, in rats, uh, also in mice, that are freely moving around and having experiences and hopefully forming memories and then retrieving those memories. So that's what we try to do. This is um, an image of the hippocampus. We're particularly interested in these cells here. And we lower these kinds of electrodes, called tetrodes, into the brain. Um, many at a time, but each individual tetrode is actually composed of four wires. This is, a, this is a trick that allows us to actually separate out the signals from uh, of the closely packed cells that surround the electrode. So it's a kind of triangulation. Any, the, the four wires pick up signals from the same population of cells, but a cell that's closer to one wire than the other will have a different profile of activity across the four wires than a different cell. So you get the spatial triangulation. So we can separate out the signals from different cells. So let me jump straight to what does a cell do in a freely moving rat, uh, a cell from the hippocampus? So the cell signals by uh, emitting something called an action potential, uh, which is, is it, it's signal that it sends to other neurons. Uh, and in this case, uh, what you're looking at is, is the behavioral path of a rat moving around a two meter square environment over the course of about 20 minutes. And you can see he's sort of moving around. He's actually searching for little sprinkles of chocolate that we put all around. And, um, but every time, so what you're looking at in red is the position in which there was a single action potential from a single uh, hippocampal neuron. And you can see that uh, the neuron really has a preference for when the animal occupies a particular location in space. So if you like, this is the first property of GPS, self-localization. It's very difficult uh, for your GPS system because you need a satellite. Uh, the rat has to use, he doesn't have a satellite system, so he uses cues and a sense of his own movements to do essentially the same thing. But you see that every time the animal comes back into this area, this cell recognizes that it's back in its sweet spot, and it fires another handful of action potentials, or we call them spikes. Then the animal runs around, and then comes back, and the cell gets interested again. This is what one cell is doing. Another cell in the same area will have a different, uh, a di what we call a receptive field, or a, a place field. And across a collection of these cells, and there are hundreds of thousands of such cells in the rat brain, 
you've got a map of space. Now, the, the, that's the first thing a GPS does. The second thing that your GPS does is it figures out how to get from where you are to where you want to go. Um, so essentially, the field had studied a lot uh, this first property of self-localization, but a lot less was known about how, uh, I even if these cells take part in this kind of uh, planning of routes. Um, and this is just to illustrate conceptually the, 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 the where we are, uh, if we've got this first part of the GPS down, but we haven't got the second part established. So we've got these cells that are firing when you enter their place fields, and you might find yourself, if you're a rat stuck in a maze, at a particular part of the maze, wondering how am I going to get out of here? And the point is that the, the place cells are just telling you about your current location. So if you really want a map in the head, you want to be able to move away from the current location and think about looking to the future, looking to look along the track, look ahead of you. So it turns out that um, it, 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 there are basically two states of activity in the hippocampus, and, this, and you can get a very broad stroke view. If you, just, uh, if you have even just a single wire in the hippocampus, you're recording something called a elect local EEG, electroencephalogram, or local field potential. This is, uh, you're looking at the um, summed activity of thousands of cells and also synaptic events. But essentially, this is when people talk about brain rhythms. This is the kind of thing they're recording. And you see that um, when an animal's running around, you've got this characteristic 8 hertz theta rhythm. And that's when the place cells are firing in their place fields. And that's, uh, until fairly recently, that was everything we knew about what these cells were doing. But it turns out that the animal has only to pause in the environment for a few seconds. And the hippocampus goes into a completely different state. Uh, and, and during this rest state, the, the theta rhythm goes away, and instead you get these uh, periodic but uh, substantial uh, what, what are called sharp waves, these events in which um, if you blow them up, they're actually, uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of activity going on during these, each of these events. Um, this turns out to be short fraction of a second events in which l a large fraction of the hippocampus is, is is firing at the same time. These are population events. So, so this, the cells are sort of behaving in their place field uh, 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 manner as the animals are running around, but it is only to pause and suddenly you get this population effect. And it hadn't been studied that much until uh, uh, 10 years ago, because it's very hard to get information about the cells unless you can record from lots of cells at the same time. So part of the brain mapping initiative is to is to increase the number of neurons that we can record from simultaneously in freely moving uh, animals um, because the idea is there may be some information there that we can't get just recording one cell at a time. And so I hope I can prove to you that that is the case. So we decided to uh, give these animals, um, give our rats a real spatial memory task. This is the kind of thing people have used many times in the past just to establish the requirement for the hippocampus uh, but we wanted to see what's, what the cells are doing. So we have this two meter by two meter arena and with little wells where chocolate can appear. And there are 36 of these wells. And there's one particular well which is where the chocolate consistently appears. And that becomes the remembered food well. And the task of the animal is to, is to find the food and then go off and explore randomly. And he doesn't know where the food will be. And then he can go back and find the food there again. Then he has to look randomly then he can go back and find the food again. And so he's toggling between random foraging and goal-directed navigation. And we can tell that he can do this well because he's much faster getting to the remembered well than he is to find the, the, un, uh, the random one. Um, so what do we do? We record very large numbers of cells simultaneously. Um, what I'm skipping over and I'm not going to talk about is the technological way we did this, but it involved miniaturizing the uh, surgical implants and the electrodes that we use. So everything got miniaturized and we increased the number. And this allowed us to resolve the activity of hundreds of uh, hippocampal neurons simultaneously. And so this is a very complicated figure, but I'll just zoom in, showing you how many of these cells have the firing fields in the environment that I was talking about. 
Um, so this is a cell that will fire in this sort of west end of the box, but here's a cell, here's a cell that fires closer to the sort of north edge. And, and, and as you can see, they're distributed throughout. So I'm going to show you what happens to the population of cells, and I'm going to use movies to do that, but I just need to explain how I'm going to do that. So we're going to decode the activity of the population of cells, and this is one of the uh, developing new techniques for decoding brain activity is one of the, one of the emphases of the, of the brain mapping initiative. Um, this, this is to summarize the, the math of it, but basically, if, I'm, if you imagine there are four cells with firing fields, these sweet spots, in four different locations, if they are going to fire just one or two action potentials simultaneously, we're going to have a very strong feeling that the animal is here. What's cool about this is that it doesn't have to actually be where the animal is. So if, if cells over here all fire together, then we're going to have a strong feeling that this is the position that's being represented by the hippocampus, even if the animal's over here. Now, if we get random activity, we're not going to have any overlap. We're not going to have a strong prediction. So we can, we can start to try and decode what the hippocampus is telling us. Now I'm going to show you a movie of this effect in action. So here we have, in, in this case, in real time, you can see a representation of the rat running around the environment. You can see his, a representation of his position and direction. That's his tail. Um, you can see the 36 wells. And the flickering is, the, is a representation of what the entire population of these 200 cells is saying about the current position of the animal. And as you can see, it very tightly follows the animal around. Um, and, and I'll just show that one more time. Even though these place fields are actually quite broad, the cells are coordinating that tri their activity together to really represent the, the location of the animal very finely. So then he ends up parked in this bottom left corner, and the question is what happens next? So this is what happens next. So then the hippocampus goes into the sharp wave mode, and there are these short bursts of activity. This, these movies are now showing four consecutive short bursts of activity. Uh, eight, the movies are actually slowed down, so this activity was actually happening much faster. So now each event took about 100 milliseconds, so a tenth of a second. What you saw was that this population is consistently representing not the current location, starts at the current location, but it moves away from the current location and towards the remembered goal. So uh, I'll break that down a little bit. These are sequences of activity. During each few milliseconds, the representation of position is very tightly uh, concentrated around some location, and the locations tend to be sequences. So I've just collapsed these sequences in time and just given you uh, uh, some randomly selected examples. But you can see from different points of the arena, you've got these sequences that extend. Uh, but there is a bias to representing where the animal wants to go. So here, um, what I've done is I've taken the, the sequences that tend to start from where the animal is and move off smoothly in space, and I've just superimposed them on top of each other. And you can see that when, the, when all the sequences start in the current location and the animal's sitting there on the home well, uh, the, there is one location that's in common, and that's the home well. But if we also take all of the locations in the rest of the environment where the animal will sit for a short period of time, these random locations, before he goes to the home well, and we superimpose those sequences, they likewise overlap mainly in the home well. So what this is telling us, it's a little complicated, but what this is telling us is that the, uh, the sequences have a tendency to represent the remembered uh, food location. So they go from the current location to the remembered food location. And that's sort of quantified here, uh, where I've got 36 possible locations, but the one that is a statistical outlier is the, is the goal location. This is the amount of representation by the hippocampus. It, at, these non, at these times when the animal's not actually eating the food at the home location. So this means that as an experimenter, 
I can look at the activity in the hippocampus and read out where the remembered goal location is. And that's not something we were able to do before. Um, I'll show you one more thing, I, which is that we've, we, we established that these sequences tend to start with the current location. They tend to end at the remembered location, but they also tend to take a trajectory that matches the future path of the animal. Um, and so I won't really explain this, but we, map, we do an analysis which tries to calculate how different the, 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 the imagined path is, the, the mental path, if you like, from the actual path taken in the future and the path taken in the past, and the future is a much better match than the past. So there's one more interesting uh, aspect of this that I'd like to emphasize. We designed the task to repeatedly present the animal with actually novel uh, demands. So how do we do that? We actually move the goal location every day. So every day he actually has to learn a new goal location. And then these other locations that the animal has to find, they never repeat within the day. So the consequence of that is that every single trial is really a novel combination of start and end location, meaning um, if you imagine the, anim the animal's uh, on day one, he's going to this goal location, then he has to search around, and he finds the food, he goes back, and he has to search around, he finds the food, and he goes back. The next day, he finds the food here, uh, he, he starts to learn that that's the goal location, then he has to look around, he randomly finds food, he goes back. But when he does so, he's never actually started here and had to go there even though it's very familiar with the environment. So this poses no problem at all for the system, as shown in this combination of behavioral and uh, sequence time scale. So this is real time. The animal finds food in a random location and then produces a sequence that depicts very nicely the future path that he has to take, even though he hasn't actually taken that specific path before. And he, if you like, thinks about something else, then we get this again, and that predicts what he does. And that's something we see repeatedly. All right. So let me just check my time. Okay. Um, so what, what, we, what we kind of knew of before was that hippocampus can act as place cells, the first part of the GPS, which is self-localization. What we didn't know so much was that they can also act, uh, they can also do the second part of the GPS, which is to determine a route to where the animal wants to go. Uh, and these sequences, they, they're, they're speeded up, they're, they take just a few hundred milliseconds, and they occur whenever the animal rests. And they can even pr depict imaginary trajectories that haven't been taken before. Um, there is a tie-in, you're wondering, okay, this is kind of interesting, thing for the rat to do. Um, but there's increasing interest uh, in the human patient literature in something called the default network, uh, which is the idea that actually when you're not, uh, uh, it comes from imaging, but when you, you are uh, at const continuously throughout, your, throughout the day, uh, your brain is entering this rest state uh, periodically when you're not immediately being stimulated by something, you're not immediately doing a task. Probably, for example, during this talk, you'd have floated in and out, you'd have seen a nice slide, and then you sort of think about it. Well, that thinking about it is thought to engage the hippocampus and areas that the hippocampus is strongly connected to. It's, uh, it probably, I mean, it has been proposed by others that this, that this kind of activity in rats might be a model for what you would be experiencing in your brains at the same, in the same kind of rest, periodic rest moments. And there's an, increasing, uh, uh, um, there's an increasing evidence, increasing literature that, that uh, certain diseases, schizophrenia and autism, can uh, be associated with damage, specifically overexcitability to this particular, um, this particular state. And in fact, one of the other things we do is we examine uh, mouse models, mouse models of disease, as has been mentioned already, and we are finding that there's specific selective overactivity and abnormal activity in this kind of offline, uh, uh, offline sequencing uh, and not necessarily in the, in the online place field activity. All right, thank you. Oh, and I should acknowledge my uh, 
my lab and my as many sponsors. Thank you.